Notice. This book is produced in Daisy Digital Talking Book, Daisy Text Only and in print format for people with bona fide print disability by V4U. This book is created for special distribution for the print disabled in accordance with Section 52 Clause 1 Sub Clause ZB of the Copyright Act of India as amended in 2012. The Daisy Digital Talking Book Daisy text only braille book is permitted to be used only by persons with print disabilities. Any further reproduction distribution to any person without a print disability or any commercial use of this book is strictly prohibited and will be subject to a legal action. Footprints without feet. Supplementary reader in English for class 10. Gandhiji's Talisman I will give you a talisman whenever you are in doubt or when the self becomes too much with you apply the following test recall the face of the poorest and the weakest man whom you may have seen and ask yourself if the step you contemplate is going to be of any use to him will he gain anything by it Will it restore him to a control over his own life and destiny? In other words, will it lead to Swaraj for the hungry and spiritually starving millions? Then you will find your doubts and yourself melting away. Contents 1. A Triumph of Surgery, page 1, by James Herriot. 2. The Thief's Story, Page 8 by Ruskin Bond. 3. The Midnight Visitor. Page 14 by Robert Arthur. 4. A Question of Trust. Page 20 by Victor Canning. 5. Footprints Without Feet. Page 26 by Head G. Wells. 6. The Making of a Scientist. Page 32 by Robert W. Peterson 7. The Necklace by Guy D. Maupassant page 39 8. The Hat Driver page 47 by Sinclair Lewis 9. Boli page 54 by K. A. Abbas 10. The Book That Saved the Earth page 63 by Claire Boyko. Chapter 1 A Triumph of Surgery Tricky, a small dog, is pampered and overfed by his rich mistress. He falls seriously ill and his mistress consults a veterinary surgeon. Does he perform an operation? Does the dog recover? Read and find out. Why is Mrs. Pumphrey worried about Tricky? What does she do to help him? Is she wise in this? Who does I refer to in this story? I was really worried about Tricky this time. I had pulled up my car when I saw him in the street with his mistress and I was shocked at his appearance. He had become hugely fat like a bloated sausage with a leg at each corner. His eyes, bloodshot and roomy, stared straight ahead and his tongue lolled from his jaws. Mrs. Pumphrey hastened to explain. He was so listless, Mr. Harriet. He seemed to have no energy. I thought he must be suffering from malnutrition, so I have been giving him some little extras between meals to build him up some malt and cod liver oil and a bowl of horlicks at nine to make him sleep. Nothing much really. And did you cut down on the sweet things as I told you? Oh, I did for a bit, but he seemed to be so weak I had to relent. He does love cream cakes and chocolates, so I can't bear to refuse him. I looked down again at the little dog. That was the trouble. Tricky's only fault was greed. He had never been known to refuse food. He would tackle a meal at any hour of the day or night. And I wondered about all the things Mrs. Pumphrey had, hadn't mentioned. Are you giving him plenty of exercise? 
Well, he has his little walks with me as you can see. But Hodgkin, the gardener, has been down with lumbago. So there has been no ra- ring throwing lately. I tried to sound severe. Now, I really mean this. If you don't cut his food right down and give him more exercise, he is going to be really ill. You must harden your heart and keep him on a very strict diet. Mrs. Pumphrey wrung her hands. Oh, I will, Mr. Harriet. I am sure you are right, but it is so difficult, so very difficult. She set off, head down, along the road as if determined to put the new regime into practice immediately. I watched their progress with growing concern. Tricky was tottering along in his little tweed coat. He had a whole wardrobe of these coats for the cold weather and a raincoat for the wet days. He struggled on, drooping in his harness. I thought it wouldn't be long before I heard from Mrs. Pumphrey. The expected call came within a few days. Mrs. Pumphrey was distraught. Tricky would eat nothing, refused even his favorite dishes and besides he had bouts of vomiting. He spent all his time lying on a rug panting, didn't want to go for walks, didn't want to do anything. I had made my plans in advance. The only way was to get Tricky out of the house for a period. I suggested that he be hospitalized for about a fortnight to be kept under observation. The poor lady almost swooned. She was sure he would pine and die if he did not see her every day. But I took a firm line. Tricky was very ill and this was the only way to save him. In fact, I thought it best to take him without delay and followed by Mrs. Pumphrey's wailings, I marched out to the car carrying the little dog wrapped in a blanket. The entire staff was roused and maids rushed in and out bringing his day bed, his night bed, favorite cushions, toys and rubber things, breakfast bowl, lunch bowl, supper bowl. Realizing that my car would never hold all the stuff, I started to drive away. As I moved off, Mrs. Pumphrey with a despairing cry threw an armful of the little coats through the window. I looked in the mirror before I turned the corner of the drive. Everybody was in tears. Out on the road, I glanced down at the pathetic little animal gasping on the seat by my side. I patted the head and Tricky made a brave effort to wag his tail. "Poor old lad," I said. "You haven't a kick in you, but I think I know a cure for you. Read and find out. Is the narrator as rich as Tricky's mistress?" How does he treat the dog? Why is he tempted to keep Tricky on as a permanent guest? Why does Mrs. Pumphrey think the dog's recovery is a triumph of surgery? At the surgery, the household dogs surged around me. Tricky looked down at the noisy pack with dull eyes and when put down, lay motionless on the carpet. The other dogs, after sniffing around him for a few seconds, decided he was an uninteresting object and ignored him i made up a bed for him in a warm loose box next to the one where the other dogs slept for two days i kept an eye on him giving him no food but plenty of water at the end of the second day he started to show some interest in his surroundings and on the third he began to whimper when we heard the dogs in the yard When I opened the door, Tricky trotted out and was immediately engulfed by Joe, the greyhound and his friends. After rolling him over and thoroughly inspecting him, the dogs moved off down the garden. Tricky followed them, rolling slightly with his surplus fat. Later that day, I was present at feeding time. I watched while Tristan slopped the food into the bowls. There was the usual headlong rush followed by the sounds of high-speed eating. Every dog knew that if he fell behind the others he was liable to have some competition for the last part of the meal. When they had finished Tricky took a walk around the shining bowls licking casually inside one or two of them. Next day an extra bowl was put out for him and I was pleased to see him jostling his way towards it. From then on his progress was rapid. He had no medical treatment of any kind but all day he ran about with the dogs joining in their friendly scrimmages he discovered the joys of being bowled over tramped on and squashed every few minutes he became an accepted member of the gang 
an unlikely silky little object among the shaggy crew fighting like a tiger for its share at meal times and hunting rats in the old hen house at night he had never had such a time in his life all the while mrs pumphrey hovered anxiously in the background ringing a dozen times a day for the latest bulletins i dodged the questions about whether his cushions were being turned regularly or his correct coat worn according to the weather but i was able to tell her that the little fellow was out of danger and convalescing rapidly the word convalescing seemed to do something to mrs pumphrey she started to bring around fresh eggs two dozen at a time to build up tricky strength for a happy period my pad my partners and i had two eggs each for breakfast but when the bottles of wine began to arrive the real possibilities of the situation began to dawn on the household it was to enrich tricky's blood lunch became a ceremonial occasion with two glasses of wine before and several during the meal we could hardly believe it when the brandy came to put a final edge on tricky's constitution for a few nights the fine spirit was rolled around inhaled and reverently drunk there were days of deep content starting well with the extra egg in the morning improved and sustained by the midday wine and finishing luxuriously around the fire with the brandy it was a temptation to keep tricky on as a permanent guest but i knew mrs pumphrey was suffering and after a fortnight felt compelled to phone and tell her that the little dog had recovered and was awaiting collection within minutes about 30 feet of gleaming black metal drew up outside the surgery the chauffeur opened the door and i could just make out the figure of mrs pumphrey almost lost in the interior her hands were tightly clasped in front of her her lips trembled oh mr harriet do tell me the truth is he really better yes he is fine there is no need for you to get out of the car i'll go and fetch him i walked through the house into the garden a mass of dogs was hurtling around and round the lawn and in their midst ears flapping tail waving was a little golden figure of tricky in two weeks he had been transformed into a little hard muscled animal he was keeping up well with the pack stretching out in great bounds his chest almost brushing the ground i carried him back along the passage to the front of the house the chauffeur was still holding the car door open and when tricky saw his mistress he took off from my arms in a tremendous leap and sailed into mrs pumphrey's lap she gave a startled oh and then had to defend herself as he swarmed over her licking her face and barking during the excitement i helped the chauffeur to bring out the beds toys cushions coats and bowls none of which had been used as the car moved away mrs pumphrey leaned out of the window tears shone in her eyes her lips trembled Oh Mr Harriet she cried how can i ever thank you this is a triumph of surgery by James Harriet glossary sausage means finely minced meat stuffed into long cylindrical cases and divided into small lengths by twisting or tying roomy means a watery discharge from a mucous membrane especially of the nose or eyes listless means lacking energy and enthusiasm lumbago means muscular pain in the lower back or the lumbar region regime means prescribed course of exercise and diet distraught means extremely worried surgery means a place where a doctor a dentist or a veterinary surgeon treats patients scrimmage means a rough or confused struggle convalescing means recovering from an illness lithe means flexible think about it one what kind of a person do you think the narrator a veterinary surgeon is would you say he is tactful as well as full of common sense two do you think tricky was happy to go home what do you think will happen now Three, do you think this is a real life episode or mere fiction, or is it a mixture of both? Talk about it. One, this episode describes the silly behavior of a rich woman who is foolishly indulgent, 
perhaps because she is lonely do you think such people are merely silly or can their actions cause harm to others two do you think there are also parents like mrs pumphrey three what would you have done if you were a member of the staff in mrs pumphrey's household a neighbor what would your life have been like in general four what would you have done if you were in the narrator's place suggested reading ricky tiki tawi by radyard kipling dog stories by james heriot a zoo in my luggage by gerald durell a tiger comes to town by r k narayan time the butterfly counts not months but moments and has time enough time is a wealth of change but the clock in its parody makes it mere change and no wealth let your life lightly dance on the edges of time like dew on the tip of a leaf by rabindranath tagore chapter 2 the thief's story a young boy makes friends with anil anil trusts him completely and employs him does the boy betray his trust read and find out who does i refer to in this story what is he a fairly successful hand at what does he get from anil in return for his work i was still a thief when i met anil and though only 15 i was an experienced and fairly successful hand anil was watching a wrestling match when i approached him he was about 25 a tall lean fellow and he looked easy going kind and simple enough for my purpose i hadn't had much of luck of late and thought i might be able to get into the young man's confidence you look a bit of a wrestler yourself i said a little flattery helps in making friends so do you he replied which put me off for a moment because at that time i was rather thin well i said modestly i do wrestle a bit What's your name? Hari Singh, I lied. I took a new name every month. That kept me ahead of the police and my former employers. After this introduction, Anil talked about the well-oiled wrestlers who were grunting, lifting and throwing each other out. I didn't have much to say. Anil walked away, I followed casually. "Hello again," he said. I gave him my most appealing smile. "I want to work for you," I said. but i can't pay you i thought that over for a minute perhaps i had misjudged my man i asked can you feed me can you cook i can cook i lied again if you can cook then maybe i can feed you he took me to his room over the jumna sweet shop and told me i could sleep on the balcony but the meal i cooked that night must have been terrible because anil gave it to a stray dog and told me to be off but i just hung around smiling in my most appealing way and he couldn't help laughing later he patted me on the head and said never mind he would teach me to cook he also taught me to write my name and said he would soon teach me to write whole sentences and to add numbers i was grateful i knew that once i could write like an educated man there would be no limit to what i could achieve it was quite pleasant working for anil I made the tea in the morning and then would take my time buying the day's supplies usually making a profit of about a rupee a day. I think he knew I made a little money this way but he did not seem to mind. Anil made money by fits and starts. He would borrow one week lend the next. He kept worrying about his next check but as soon as it arrived he would go out and celebrate. It seems he wrote for magazines. a queer way to make a living one evening he came home with a small bundle of notes saying he had just sold a book to a publisher at night i saw him tuck the money under the mattress i had been working for anil for almost a month and apart from cheating on the shopping had not done anything in my line of work i had every opportunity for doing so anil had given me a key to the door and i could come and go as i pleased He was the most trusting person I had ever met. 
and that is why it was so difficult to rob him it's easy to rob a greedy man because he can afford to be robbed but it's difficult to rob a careless man sometimes he doesn't even notice he's been robbed and that takes all the pleasure out of the work well it's time i did some real work i told myself i am out of practice and if i don't take the money he will only waste it on his friends after all he doesn't even pay me read and find out how does the thief think anil will react to the theft what does he say about the different reactions of people when they are robbed does anil realize that he has been robbed anil was asleep a beam of moonlight stepped over the balcony and fell on the bed i sat up on the floor considering the situation if i took the money i could catch the 10:30 express to lucknow slipping out of the ba- blanket i crept up to the bed anil was sleeping peacefully his face was clear and unlined even i had more marks on my face though mine was mostly scars my hand slid under the mattress searching for the notes when i found them i drew them out without a sound anil sighed in his sleep and turned on his side towards me i was startled and quickly crawled out of the room when i was on the road i began to run i had the notes at my waist held there by the string of my pajamas i slowed down to a walk and counted the notes 600 rupees in 50s i could live like an oil rich arab for a week or two when i reached the station i did not stop at the ticket office i had never bought a ticket in my life but dashed straight to the platform the lucknow express was just moving out the train had still to pick up speed and i should have been able to jump into one of the carriages but i hesitated for some reason i can't explain and i lost the chance to get away when the train had gone i found myself standing alone on the deserted platform i had no idea where to spend the night i had no friends believing that friends were more trouble than help and i did not want to make anyone curious by staying at one of the small hotels near the station the only person i knew really well was the man i had robbed leaving the station i walked slowly through the bazaar in my short career as a thief i had made a study of men's faces when they had lost their goods the greedy man showed fear the rich man showed anger the poor man showed acceptance but i knew that anil's face when he discovered the theft would show only a touch of sadness not for the loss of money but for the loss of trust i found myself in the maidan and sat down on a bench the night was chilly it was early november and a light drizzle added to my discomfort soon it was raining quite heavily my shirt and pajamas stuck to my skin and a cold wind blew the rain across my face i went back to the bazaar and sat down in the shelter of the clock tower the clock showed midnight i felt for the notes they were damp from the rain anil's money in the morning he would probably have given me 2 or 3 rupees to go to the cinema but now i had it all i couldn't cook his meals run to the bazaar or learn to write whole sentences anymore i had forgotten about them in the excitement of the theft whole sentences i knew could one day bring me more than a few hundred rupees it was a simple matter to steal and sometimes just as simple to be caught but to be a really big man a clever and respected man was something else i should go back to anil i told myself if only to learn to read and write i hurried back to the room feeling very nervous for it is much easier to steal something than to return it undetected i opened the door quietly then stood in the doorway in clouded moonlight anil was still asleep i crept to the head of the bed and my hand came up with the notes i felt his breath on my hand i remained still for a minute then my hand found the edge of the mattress and slipped under it with the notes i awoke late next morning to find that anil had already made the tea he stretched out his hand towards me there was a 50 rupee note between his fingers my heart sank i thought i had been discovered i made some money yesterday he explained 
now you will be paid regularly my spirits rose but when i took the note i saw it was still wet from the night's rain today we will start writing sentences he said he knew but neither his lips nor his eyes showed anything i smiled at anil in my most appealing way and the smile came by itself without any effort by ruskin bond glossary flattery means insincere praise modestly means without boasting in a humble way grunting means making low guttural sounds appealing means attractive unlined means showing no sign of worry or anxiety think about it one what are hari singh's reactions to the prospect of receiving an education do they change over time compare for example the thought i knew that once i could write like an educated man there would be no limit to what i could achieve with these later thoughts whole sentences i knew could one day bring me more than a few hundred rupees it was a simple matter to steal and sometimes just as simple to be caught but to be a really big man a clever and respected man was something else what makes him return to anil to why does not anil hand the thief over to the police do you think most people would have done so in what ways is anil different from such employers talk about it one do you think people like anil and hari singh are found only in fiction or are there such people in real life two do you think it is a significant detail in the story that anil is a struggling writer does this explain his behavior in any way three have you met anyone like hari singh can you think and imagine the circumstances that can turn a 15 year old boy into a thief four where is the story set you can get clues from the names of the persons and places mentioned in it which language or languages are spoken in these places do you think the characters in the story spoke to each other in english suggested reading he said it with arsenic by ruskin bond wanka by anton chekhov a scandal in bohemia by arthur conan doyle chapter 3 the midnight visitor ofable a secret agent is expecting to get a very important report another secret agent max threatens him with a pistol demanding the report does ofable out with him read and find out how is ofable different from other secret agents who is fowler and what is his first authentic thrill of the day Ossable did not fit any description of a secret agent Fowler had ever read. Follow him him down the musty corridor of the gloomy French hotel where Ossable had a room. Fowler felt let down. It was a small room on the 6th and top floor and scarcely a setting for a romantic adventure. Ossable was for one thing fat, very fat. And then there was his accent. Though he spoke French and German passably, he had never altogether lost the American accent he had brought to Paris from Boston 20 years ago. "You are disappointed," Ossable said wheezily over his shoulder. "You were told that I was a secret agent, a spy dealing in espionage and danger. You wished to meet me because you are a writer, young and romantic. You envisioned mysterious figures in the night, the crack of pistols, drugs and the wine." Instead you have spent a dull evening in a French music hall with a sloppy fat man who instead of having messages slipped into his hand by dark-eyed beauties gets only a prosaic telephone call making an appointment in his room you have been bored the fat man chuckled to himself as he unlocked the door of his room and stood aside to let his frustrated guest enter you are disillusioned ossable told him but take cheer my young friend Presently you will see a paper a quite important paper for which several men and women have risked their lives come to me some day soon that paper may well affect the course of history 
in that thought is drama is there not as he spoke osable closed the door behind him then he switched on the light and as the light came on fowler had his first authentic thrill of the day for halfway across the room a small automatic pistol in his hand stood a man osable blinked a few times max he wheezed you gave me quite a start i thought you were in berlin what are you doing here in my room read and find out how has max got in how does osable say he got in max was slender a little less than tall with features that suggested slightly the crafty pointed countenance of a fox there was about him aside from the gun nothing especially menacing the report he murmured the report that is being brought to you tonight concerning some new missiles i thought i would take it from you it will be safer in my hands than in yours osable moved to an armchair and sat down heavily i'm going to raise the devil with the management this time and you can bet on it he said grimly this is the second time in a month that somebody has got into my room through the nuisance of a balcony fowler's eyes went to the single window of the room it was an ordinary window against which now the night was pressing blackly balcony max said with a rising inflection no a pass key i did not know about the balcony it might have saved me some trouble had i known it's not my balcony osable said with extreme irritation it belongs to the next apartment he glanced explanatorily at fowler you see he said this room used to be a part of a large unit and the next room through the door there used to be the living room it had the balcony which extends under my window now you can get on to it from the empty room two doors down and somebody did last month the management promised to block it off but they haven't max glanced at fowler who was standing stiffly not far from ausable and waved the gun with a commanding gesture please sit down he said we have a wait of half an hour i think 31 minutes ausable said smoothly the appointment was for 12:30 i wish i knew how you learned about the report max the little spy smiled evilly and we wish we knew how your people got the report but no harm has been done i will get it back tonight what is that who is at the door fowler jumped at the sudden knocking at the door ausable just smiled that will be the police he said i thought that such an important paper as the one we are waiting for should have a little extra protection i told them to check on me to make sure everything was all right max bit his lip nervously the knocking was repeated what will you do now max ausable asked if i do not answer the door they will enter anyway the door is unlocked and they will not hesitate to shoot max face was black with anger as he backed swiftly towards the window he swung a leg over the sill send them away he warned i will wait on the balcony send them away or i will shoot and take my chances the knocking at the door became louder and a voice was raised mr osable mr osable keeping his body twisted so that his gun still covered the fat man and his guest the man on the window grasped the frame with his free hand to support himself then he swung his other leg up and over the window sill the door knob turned swiftly max pushed with his left hand to free himself from the sill and dropped to the balcony and then as he dropped he screamed once shrilly the door opened and a waiter stood there with a tray a bottle and two glasses here is the drink you ordered for when you returned he said and set the tray on the table deftly uncorked the bottle and left the room white faced fowler stared after him but he stammered the police there was no police or sable side only henry whom i was expecting but won that man out on the window fowler began no said our sable he won't return you see my young friend there is no balcony by robert arthur glossary romantic means imaginative having a fantastic view of reality possibly means just well enough tolerably well espionage means spying sloppy means carelessly dressed 
prosaic means ordinary chuckled means laughed quietly without opening his mouth wheezed means spoke breathing noisily and heavily missiles means weapons directed by remote control or automatically shrilly means piercingly in a high pitch think about it one Osable did not fit any description of a secret agent Fowler had ever read. What do secret agents in books and films look like in your opinion? Discuss in groups or in class some stories or movies featuring spies, detectives and secret agents and compare their appearance with that of Osable in the story. You may mention characters from fiction in languages other than English. In English fiction you may have come across Sherlock Holmes, Hercule Poirot, or miss marple have you watched any movies featuring james bond 2 how does osable manage to make max believe that there is a balcony attached to his room look back at his detailed description of it what makes it a convincing story 3 looking back at the story when do you think osable thought up his plan for getting rid of max do you think he had worked out his plan in detail right from the beginning or did he make up a plan taking advantage of events as they happened talk about it one in this story osable shows great presence of mind or the ability to think quickly and act calmly and wisely in a situation of danger and surprise give examples from your own experience or narrate a story which shows someone's presence of mind two Discuss what you would do in the situations described below. Remember that presence of mind comes out of a state of mental preparedness. If you have thought about possible problems or dangers and about how to act in such situations, you have a better chance of dealing with such situations if they do arise. A small fire starts in your kitchen. A child starts to choke on a piece of food. An electrical appliance starts to hiss and give gives out sparks. A bicycle knocks down a pedestrian. It rains continuously for more than 24 hours. A member of your family does not return home at the usual or expected time. You may suggest other such situations. Suggested reading. After 20 years by O Henry, The Stolen Basilisk by H.G. Wells, The Face on the Wall by E.V. Lucas. Haiku. an old pond a frog jumps in the sound of water by matsuo basho right at my feet and when did you get here snail by isa the above two poems are examples of haiku haiku is a poetic form and a type of poetry from the japanese culture haiku combines form content and language in a meaningful yet compact form the most common form of haiku is three short lines the themes include nature feelings or experiences chapter 4 a question of trust it is said that you must set a thief to catch a thief but it is also said that there is honor among thieves Which saying does the story illustrate? Read and find out. What does Horace Danby like to collect? Why does he steal every year? Everyone thought that Horace Danby was a good, honest citizen. He was about fifty years old and unmarried, and he lived with the housekeeper who worried over his health. In fact, he was usually very well and happy, except for attacks of hay fever in summer. He made locks and was successful enough at his business to have two helpers. Yes, Horace Danby was good and respectable, but not completely honest. Fifteen years ago, Horace had served his first and only sentence in a prison library. He loved rare, expensive books, so he robbed a safe every year. Each year, he planned carefully just what he would do. stole enough to last for 12 months and secretly bought the books he loved through an agent now walking in the bright july sunshine he felt sure that this year's robbery was going to be as successful as the others 
For two weeks, he had been studying the house at Shotover Grange, looking at its rooms, its electrical wiring, its paths, and its garden. This afternoon, the two servants who remained in the Grange while the family was in London had gone to the movies. Hore saw them go, and he felt happy in spite of a little tickle of hay fever in his nose. He came out from behind the garden wall. his tools carefully packed in a bag on his back there were about 15000 pounds worth of jewelry in the grange safe if he sold them one by one he expected to get at least 5000 enough to make him happy for another year there were three very interesting books coming up for sale in the autumn now he would get the money he wanted to buy them he had seen the housekeeper hang the key to the kitchen door on a hook outside He put on a pair of gloves, took the key and opened the door. He was always careful not to leave any fingerprints. A small dog was lying in the kitchen. It stirred, made a noise and moved its tail in a friendly way. "All right, Sherry," Hore said as he passed. "All you had to do to keep dogs quiet was to call them by their right names and show them love." The safe was in the da- drawing room behind a rather poor painting. Horace wondered for a moment whether he should collect pictures instead of books but they took up too much room in the small house books were better there was a great bowl of flowers on the table and horace felt his nose tickle he gave a little sneeze and then put down his bag he carefully arranged his tools he had 4 hours before the servants returned the safe was not going to be hard to open After all he had lived with locks and safes all his life. The burglar alarm was poorly built. He went into the hall to cut its wire. He came back and sneezed loudly as the smell of the flowers came to him again. How foolish people are when they own valuable things. Horace thought. A magazine article had described this house giving a plan of all the rooms and picture of this room. The writer had even mentioned that the painting hid a safe but Horace found that the flowers were hindering him in his work He buried his face in his handkerchief then he heard a voice from the doorway What is it a cold or hay fever Before he could think Horace said hay fever and found himself sneezing again The voice went on you can cure it with a special treatment you know If you find out just what plant gives you the disease I think you would be better see a doctor if you are serious about your work I heard you from the top of the house just now Read and find out who is speaking to Horace Danby who is the real culprit in the story It was a quiet kindly voice but one with firmness in it A woman was standing in the doorway and Sherry was rubbing against her She was young quite pretty and was dressed in red she walked to the fireplace and straightened the ornaments there down sherry she said anyone would think i had been away for a month she smiled at horace and went on however i came back just in time though i didn't expect to meet a burglar horace had some hope because she seemed to be amused at meeting him he might avoid trouble if he treated her the right way he replied I didn't expect to meet one of the family. She nodded. I see what an inconvenience it is for you to meet me. What are you going to do? Hore said, my first thought was to run. Of course you could do that, but I would telephone the police and tell them all about you. They would get you at once. Hore said, I would of course cut the telephone wires first and then he hesitated a smile on his face. I would make sure that you could do nothing for some time. few hours would be enough she looked at him seriously you would hurt me horace paused and then said i think i was trying to frighten you when i said that you didn't frighten me horace suggested it would be nice if you would forget you ever saw me let me go the voice was suddenly sharp why should i you were going to rob me if i let you go you will only rob someone else society must be protected from men like you horace smiled I am not a man who threatens society. I steal only from those who have a lot of money. I steal for a very good reason and I hate the thought of prison. 
she laughed and he begged thinking that he had persuaded her look i have no right to ask you for anything but i am desperate let me go and i promise never to do this kind of a thing again i really mean it she was silent watching him closely then she said you are really afraid of going to prison aren't you she came over to him shaking her head i have always liked the wrong kind of people she picked up a silver box from the table and took a cigarette from it horace eager to please her and seeing that she might help him took off his gloves and gave her his cigarette lighter you will let me go he held the lighter towards her yes but only if you will do something for me anything you say before we left for london i promised my husband to take my jewels to a bank but i left them here in the safe i want to wear them to a party tonight so i came down to get them but hore smiled you have forgotten the numbers to open the safe haven't you yes replied the young lady just leave it to me and you will have them within an hour but i will have to break your safe don't worry about that my husband won't be here for a month and i'll have the safe mended by that time and within an hour horace had opened the safe given her the jewels and gone happily away for two days he kept his promise to the kind young lady on the morning of the third day however he thought of the books he wanted and he knew he would have to look for another safe but he never got the chance to begin his plan by noon a policeman had arrested him for the jewel robbery at shotover grange his fingerprints for he had opened the safe without gloves were all over the room and no one believed him when he said that the wife of the owner of the house had asked him to open the safe for her the wife herself a gray-haired sharp-tongued woman of 60 said that the story was nonsense horace is now the assistant librarian in the prison he often thinks of the charming clever young lady who was in the same profession as he was and who tricked him he gets very angry when anyone talks about honor among thieves by victor canning glossary hay fever means a disorder affecting the nose and throat caused by allergy to pollen or dust think about it one did you begin to suspect before the end of the story that the lady was not the person horace danby took her to be If so at what point did you realize this and how Two what are the subtle ways in which the lady manages to deceive Horace Danby into thinking she is the lady of the house Why doesn't Horace suspect that something is wrong Three Horace Danby was good and respectable but not completely honest Why do you think this description is apt for Horace Why can't he be categorized as a typical thief Four, Horace Danby was a meticulous planner, but still he faltered. Where did he go wrong, and why? Talk about it. One, do you think Horace Danby was unfairly punished, or that he deserved what he got? Two, do intentions justify actions? Would you, like Horace Danby, do something wrong if you thought your ends justified the means? Do you think that there are situations in which it is excusable to act less than honestly? Suggested reading The Unexpected by Ella Edkin The Confession by Anton Chekhov A Case for the Defense by Graham Greene Chapter 5 Footprints Without Feet Can a man become invisible? This is the story of a scientist who discovers how to make himself invisible. Does he use or misuse his discovery? Read and find out how did the invisible man first become visible? Why was he wandering the streets? The two boys started in surprise at the fresh muddy imprints of a pair of bare feet. What was a barefooted man doing on the steps of a house in the middle of London? and where was the man as they gazed a remarkable sight met their eyes a fresh footmark appeared from nowhere further footprints followed one after another descending the steps and progressing down the street the boys followed 
fascinated until the muddy impressions became fainter and fainter and at last disappeared altogether the explanation of the mystery was really simple enough the bewildered boys had been following a scientist who had just discovered how to make the human body transparent griffin the scientist had carried out experiment after experiment to prove that the human body could become invisible finally he swallowed certain rare drugs and his body became as transparent as a sheet of glass though it also remained as solid as glass brilliant scientist though he was griffin was rather a lawless person his landlord disliked him and tried to eject him in revenge griffin set fire to the house to get away without being seen he had to remove his clothes thus it was that he became a homeless wanderer without clothes without money and quite invisible until he happened to step in some mud and left footprints as he walked he escaped easily enough from the boys who followed his foot st- footprints in london but his adventures were by no means over he had chosen a bad time of the year to wander about london without clothes it was mid winter the air was bitterly cold and he could not do without clothes instead of walking about the streets he decided to slip into a big london store for warmth closing time arrived and as soon as the doors were shut griffin was able to give himself the pleasure of clothing and feeding himself without regard to expense he broke open boxes and wrappers and fitted himself out with warm clothes soon with shoes and overcoat and a wide brimmed hat he became a fully dressed and visible person in the kitchen of the restaurant he found cold meat and coffee and he followed up the meal with sweets and wine taken from the grocery store finally he settled down to sleep on a pile of quilts if only griffin had managed to wake up in good time all might have been well as it was he did not wake up until the assistants were already arriving next morning when he saw a couple of them approaching he panicked and began to wonder they naturally gave chase in the end he was able to escape only by quickly taking off his newly found clothes so once more he found himself invisible but naked in the chill january air this time he decided to try the stock of a theatrical company in the hope of finding not only clothes but also something that would hide the empty space above his shoulders shivering with cold he hurried to drury lane the center of the theater world he soon found a suitable shop he made his way invisible upstairs and came out a little later wearing bandages around his forehead dark glasses false nose big bushy side whiskers and a large hat to escape without being seen he carelessly attacked the shopkeeper from behind after which he robbed him of all the money he could find read and find out why does mrs hall find the scientist eccentric what curious episode occurs in the study what other extraordinary things happen at the inn eager to get away from crowded london he took a train to the village of ipping where he booked two rooms at the local inn the arrival of a stranger at an inn in winter was in any case an unusual event a stranger of such uncommon appearance set all tongues wagging mrs hall the landlord's wife made every effort to be friendly but griffin had no desire to talk and told her my reason for coming to ipping is a desire for solitude i do not wish to be disturbed in my work besides an accident has affected my face satisfied that her guest was an eccentric scientist and in view of the fact that he had paid her in advance mrs hall was prepared to excuse his strange habits and irritable temper but the stolen money did not last long and presently griffin had to admit that he had no more ready cash he pretended however that he was expecting a check to arrive at any moment shortly afterwards a curious episode occurred very nearly in the morning a clergyman and his wife were awakened by noises in the study creeping downstairs they heard the chink of money being taken from the clergyman's desk without making any noise and with the poker grasped firmly in his hand the clergyman flung open the door surrender 
Then, to his amazement, he realized that the room appeared to be empty. He and his wife looked under the desk and behind the curtains and even up the chimney. There wasn't a sign of anybody, yet the desk had been opened and the housekeeping money was missing. Extraordinary affair, the clergyman kept saying for the rest of the day. But it was not as extraordinary as the behavior of Mrs. Hall's furniture a little later that morning. The landlord and his wife were up very early and were surprised to see the scientist's door wide open. Usually it was shut and locked and he was furious if anyone entered his room. The opportunity seemed too good to be missed. They peeped around the door, saw nobody and decided to investigate. The bedclothes were cold, showing that the scientist must have been up for some time. And stranger still, the clothes and bandages that he always wore were lying about the room. All of a sudden, Mrs. Hall heard a sniff close to her ear. A moment later, the hat on the bedpost leapt up and dashed itself into her face. Then, the bedroom chair became alive. Springing into the air, it charged straight at her, legs foremost. As she and her husband turned away in terror, the extraordinary chair pushed them both out of the room and then appeared to slam and lock the door after them. Mrs. Hall almost fell down the stairs in hysterics. She was convinced that the room was haunted by spirits and that the stranger had somehow caused these to enter into her furniture. My poor mother used to sit in that chair, she moaned, to think it should rise up against me now. The feeling among the neighbours was that the trouble was caused by witchcraft. But witchcraft or not, when news of the burglary at the clergyman's home became known, the strange scientist was strongly suspected of having had a hand in it. Suspicion grew even stronger when he suddenly produced some ready cash, though he had admitted not long before that he had no money. The village constable was secretly sent for. Instead of waiting for the constable, Mrs. Hall went to the scientist, who had somehow mysteriously appeared from his empty bedroom. I want to know what you have been doing to my chair upstairs, she demanded, and I want to know how it is you came out of an empty room and how you entered a locked room. The scientist was always quick-tempered. Now he became furious. You don't understand who or what I am, he shouted. Very well, I'll show you. Suddenly, he threw off bandages, whiskers, spectacles and even nose. It took him only a minute to do this. The horrified people in the bar found themselves staring at a headless man. Mrs. Jaffers, the constable, now arrived and was quite surprised to find that he had to arrest a man without a head. But Jaffers was not easily prevented from doing his duty. If a magistrate's warrant ordered a person's arrest, then that person had to be arrested with or without his head. There followed a remarkable scene as the policeman tried to get hold of a man who was becoming more and more invisible as he threw off one garment after another. Finally, a shirt flew into the air and the constable found himself struggling with someone he could not see at all. Some people tried to help him but found themselves hit by blows that seemed to come from nowhere. In the end, Jaffers was knocked unconscious as he made a last attempt to hold on to the unseen scientist. There were nervous, excited cries of hold him, but this was easier said than done. Griffin had shaken himself free and no one knew where to lay hands on him. By Hedgy Wells Think about it. 1. Griffin was rather a lawless person. Comment 2. How would you assess Griffin as a scientist? Talk about it. 1. Would you like to become invisible? What advantages and disadvantages do you foresee if you did? 2. Are there forces around us that are invisible? For example, magnetism. Are there aspects of matter that are invisible or not visible to the naked eye? What would the word be like? if you could see such forces or such aspects of matter. 3. What makes glass or water transparent? What is the scientific explanation for this? Do you think it would be scientifically possible for a man to become invisible or transparent? Keep in mind that writers of science fiction have often turned out to be prophetic in their imagination. 
suggested reading the invisible man by hg wells as far as the human eye can see by isaac asimov it happened tomorrow by bal fondke the making of a scientist richard e bright has received the searle scholar award and the skerrick plow award for biochemistry and molecular biology it was his fascination for butterflies that opened the world of science to him read and find out how did a book become a turning point in richard e bright's life how did his mother help him at the age of 22 a former scout of the year excited the scientific world with a new theory on how cells work richard h e bright and his college roommate explained the theory in an article in the proceedings of the national academy of science It was the first time this important scientific journal had ever published the work of college students in sports that would be like making the big leagues at the age of 15 and hitting a home run your first time at bat. For Richard E Bright it was the first in a long string of achievements in science and other fields and it all started with butterflies. An only child E Bright grew up north of Reading, Pennsylvania. There wasn't much I could do there he said. I certainly couldn't play football or baseball with a team of one but there was one thing I could do collect things so he did and did he ever beginning in kindergarten ebright collected butterflies with the same determination that has marked all his activities he also collected rocks fossils and coins he became an eager astronomer too sometimes stargazing at night from the first he had a driving curiosity along with a bright mind He also had a mother who encouraged his interest in learning. She took him on trips, bought him telescopes, microscopes, cameras, mounting materials and other equipment and helped him in many other ways. I was his only companion until he started school, his mother said. After that I would bring home friends for him, but at night we just did things together. Richie was my whole life after his father died when Richie was in 3rd grade. She and her son spent almost every evening at the dining room table. If he didn't have things to do, I found work for him, not physical work but learning things. His mother said he liked it, he wanted to learn. And learned he did. He earned top grades in school. On every day things like he was just like every other kid, his mother said. By the time he was in second grade, E Bright had collected all 25 species of butterflies found around his home town. see the following box species and subspecies of butterflies collected in 6 weeks in reading pennsylvania gossamer winged butterflies included white m hair streak acadian hair streak bronze copper bog copper purplish copper eastern tailed blue melissa blue silvery blue snout butterfly wood nymphs and satyrs include eyed brown wood nymph or grayling monarchs monarch or milkweed whites and sulfurs include olympia cloudless sulfur european cabbage brush footed butterflies included variegated fritillary harris's checker spot pearl crescent morning cloak painted lady buckeye white roy white admiral red spotted purple hackberry that probably would have been the end of my butterfly collecting he said but then my mother got me a children's book called the travels of monarch x that book which told how monarch butterflies migrate to central america opened the world of science to the eager young collector at the end of the book readers were invited to help study butterfly migrations they were asked to tag butterflies for research by dr frederick a urquhart of the University of Toronto Canada Ebright's mother wrote to Dr Urquhart and soon Ebright was attaching light adhesive tags to the wings of monarchs anyone who found a tagged butterfly was asked to send the tag to Dr Urquhart the butterfly collecting season around reading lasts 6 weeks in late summer if you are going to chase them one by one you won't catch very many so the next step for ebright was to raise a flock of butterflies he would catch a female monarch 
take her eggs and raise them in his basement through their life cycle from egg to caterpillar to pupa to adult butterfly then he would tag the butterfly's wings and let them go for several years his basement was home to thousands of monarchs in different stages of development eventually i began to lose interest in tagging butterflies it's tedious and there's not much feedback e bright said in all the time i did it he laughed only two butterflies had i had tagged were recaptured and they were not more than 75 miles from where i lived read and find out what lessons does e bright learn when he does not win anything at a science fair what experiments and projects that does he take what are the qualities that go into the making of a scientist then in the 7th grade he got a hint of what real science is when he entered a county science fair and lost it was really a sad feeling to sit there and not get anything while everybody else had won something e bright said his entry was slides of frog tissues which he showed under a microscope he realized the winners had tried to do real experiments not simply make a neat display already the competitive spirit that drives richard e bright was appearing i knew that for the next year's fair i would have to do a real experiment he said the subject i knew most about was the insect work i had been doing in the past several years so he wrote to dr urquhart for ideas and back came a stack of suggestions for experiments those kept e bright busy all through high school and led to prize projects in county and international science fairs for his eighth grade project e bright tried to find the cause of a viral disease that kills nearly all monarch caterpillars every few years e bright thought the disease might be carried by a beetle he tried raising caterpillars in the presence of beetles i didn't get any real results he said but i went ahead and showed that i had tried the experiment this time i won the next year his science fair project was testing the theory that viceroy butterflies copy monarchs the theory was that viceroys look like monarchs because monarchs don't taste good to birds viceroys on the other hand do taste good to birds so the more they look like monarchs the less likely they are to become a birds dinner e bright's project was to see whether in fact birds would eat monarchs he found that a startling would not eat ordinary bird food it would eat all the monarchs it could get e bright said later research by other people show that viceroys probably do copy the monarch this project was placed first in the zoology division and third overall in the county science fair in his second year in high school richard e bright began the research that led to his discovery of an unknown insect hormone indirectly it also led to his new theory on the life of cells the question he tried to answer was simple what is the purpose of the 12 tiny gold spots on a monarch pupa everyone assumed the spots were just ornamental e bright said but dr urquhart didn't believe it to find the answer e bright and another excellent science student first had to build a device that showed that the spots were producing a hormone necessary for the butterfly's full development this project won e bright first place in the county fair and entry into the international science and engineering fair there he won third place for zoology he also got a chance to work during the summer at the entomology laboratory of the walter reed army institute of research as a high school junior richard e bright continued his advanced experiments on the monarch pupa that year his project won first place at the international science fair and gave him another chance to work in the army laboratory during the summer in his senior year he went a step further he grew cells from a monarch's wing in a culture and showed that the cells would divide and develop into normal butterfly wing scales only if they were fed the hormone from the gold spots that project won first place for zoology at the international fair he spent the summer after graduation doing further work at the army laboratory and at the laboratory of the us department of agriculture the following summer 
After his freshman year at Harvard University, Ebright went back to the laboratory of the Department of Agriculture and did more work on the hormone from the gold spots. Using the laboratory's sophisticated instruments, he was able to identify the hormone's chemical structure. A year and a half later, during his junior year, Ebright got the idea for his new theory about cell life. It came while he was looking at x-ray photos of the chemical structure of a hormone. When he saw those photos, Ebright didn't shout Eureka or even I've got it. But he believed that along with his findings about insect hormones, the photos gave him the answer to one of biology's puzzles. How the cell can read the blueprint of its DNA. DNA is the substance in the nucleus of a cell that controls heredity. It determines the form and function of the cell. Thus, DNA is the blueprint for life. E. Bright and his college roommate James R. Wong worked all that night drawing pictures and constructing plastic models of molecules to show how it could happen. Together, they later wrote the paper that explained the theory. Surprising no one who knew him, Richard E. Bright graduated from Harvard with the highest honors, second in his class of 1510. E. Bright went on to become a graduate student researcher at Harvard Medical School. There, he began doing experiments to test his theory. If the theory proves correct, it will be a big step towards understanding the processes of life. It might also lead to new ideas for preventing some types of cancer and other diseases. All of this is possible because of E. Bright's scientific curiosity. His high school research into the purpose of the spots on a monarch pupa eventually led him to his theory about cell life. Richard E. Bright has been interested in science since he first began collecting butterflies, but not so deeply that he hasn't time for other interests. E. Bright also became a champion debater and public speaker and a good canoeist and all-around outdoors person. He is also an expert photographer, particularly of nature and scientific exhibits. In high school, Richard E. Bright was a straight A student. Because learning was easy, he turned a lot of his energy towards the debating and model United Nations clubs. He also found someone to admire, Richard A. Weher his social studies teacher and advisor to both clubs. Mr. Weher was the perfect person for me. He opened my mind to new ideas, E. Bright said. Richard would always give that extra effort, Mr. Weher said. What pleased me was, here was this person who put in three or four hours at night doing debate research besides doing all his research with butterflies and his other interests. Richard was competitive, Mr. Weher said but not in a bad sense, he explained. Richard wasn't interested in winning for winning's sake or winning to get a prize. Rather, he was winning because he wanted to do the best job he could. For the right reasons, he wants to be the best. And that is one of the ingredients in the making of a scientist. Start with a first-rate mind, add curiosity and mix in the will to win for the right reasons. E. Bright has these qualities. From the time the book The Travels of Monarch X opened the world of science to him, Richard E. Bright has never lost his scientific curiosity. By Robert W. Peterson Glossary Leagues mean groups of sports clubs or teams playing matches among themselves. County means region. Starling means common European bird with black brown spotted plumage which nests near buildings and is a good mimic. Entomology means the study of insects. Eureka means a cry of triumph at a discovery. Canoeist means a person who paddles a canoe, a light boat. Think about it. 1. How can one become a scientist, an economist, a historian? Does it simply involve reading many books on the subject? Does it involve observing, thinking and doing experiments? 2. You must have read about cells and DNA in your science books. Discuss Richard E. Bright's work in the light of what you have studied. If you get an opportunity to work like Richard E. Bright on projects and experiments, which field would you like to work on and why? Talk about it. 1. 
children everywhere wonder about the world around them the questions they ask are the beginning of scientific enquiry given below are some questions that children in india have asked professor yash pal and dr rahul pal as reported in their book discovered questions ncert 2006 what is dna fingerprinting what are its uses how do honey bees identify their own honeycombs why does rain fall in drops can you answer these questions you will find professor yash pal's and dr rahul pal's answers on page 75 two you also must have wondered about certain things around you share these questions with your class and try and answer them suggested reading journey by night by nora burke children who made it big by tangamani school days by tom brown chapter 7 the necklace matilda is invited to a grand party she has a beautiful dress but no jewelry she borrows a necklace from a friend and loses it what happens then read and find out what kind of a person is ni lozen with why is she always unhappy what kind of a person is her husband she was one of those pretty young ladies born as if through an error of destiny into a family of clerks she had no dowry no hopes no means of becoming known loved and married by a man either rich or distinguished and she allowed herself to marry a petty clerk in the office of the board of education she was simple but she was unhappy she suffered incessantly feeling herself born for all delicacies and luxuries she suffered from the poverty of her apartment the shabby walls and the worn chairs all these things tortured and angered her when she seated herself for dinner opposite her husband who uncovered the tureen with a delighted air saying oh the good pot pie i know nothing better than that she would think of elegant dinners of shining silver she thought of the exquisite food served in marvelous dishes she had neither frocks nor jewels nothing and she loved only those things she had a rich friend a schoolmate at the convent who she did not like to visit she suffered so much when she returned she wept for whole days from despair and disappointment one evening her husband returned elated bearing in his hand a large envelope here he said here is something for you she quickly drew out a printed card on which were inscribed these words the minister of public instruction and madam george rampogne asked the honor of miss you and madam luzel's company Monday evening January 18 at the minister's residence instead of being delighted as her husband had hoped she threw the invitation spitefully upon the table murmuring what do you suppose i want with that but my dearie i thought it would make you happy you never go out and this is an occasion and a fine one everybody wishes one and it is very select not many are given to employees you will see the whole official world there She looked at him with an irritated eye and declared impatiently, "What do you suppose I have to wear to such a thing as that?" He had not thought of that. He stammered, "Why, the dress you wear when you go to the theater. It seems very pretty to me." He was silent, stupefied in dismay at the sight of his wife weeping. He stammered, "What is the matter? What is the matter?" By a violent effort she had controlled her vexation and responded in a calm voice wiping her moist cheeks nothing only i have no dress and consequently i cannot go to this affair give your card to some colleague whose wife is better fitted out than i he was grieved but answered let us see matilda how much would a suitable costume cost something that would serve for other occasions something very simple she reflected for some seconds thinking of a sum that she could ask for without bringing with it an immediate refusal and a frightened exclamation from the economical clerk finally she said in a hesitating voice i cannot tell exactly but it seems to me that 400 francs ought to cover it he turned a little pale 
for he had saved just the sum to buy a gun that he might be able to join some hunting parties the next summer with some friends who went to shoot larks on sunday nevertheless he answered very well i will give you 400 francs but try to have a pretty dress read and find out what fresh problem now disturbs madame lozel how is the problem solved the day of the ball approached and madame lozel seemed sad disturbed anxious nevertheless her dress was nearly ready her husband said to her one evening what is the matter with you you have acted strangely for two or three days and she responded i am vexed not to have a jewel nothing to adorn myself with i shall have such a poverty stricken look i would prefer not to go to this party he replied you can wear some natural flowers if this season they look very chic she was not convinced no she replied there is nothing more humiliating than to have a shabby air in the midst of rich women then her husband cried out how stupid we are go and find your friend madam forestier and ask her to lend you her jewels she uttered a cry of joy it is true she said i had not thought of that the next day she took herself to her friend's house and related her story of distress madam forestier went to her closet took out a large jewel case brought it opened it and said choose my dear she saw at first some bracelets then a collar of pearls then the venetian cross of gold and jewels of admirable workmanship she tried the jewels before the glass hesitated but could neither decide to take them nor leave them then she asked have you nothing more why yes look for yourself i do not know what will please you suddenly she discovered in a black satin box a superb necklace of diamonds her hands trembled as she took it out she placed it about her throat against her dress and was ecstatic then she asked in a hesitating voice full of anxiety could you let me this only this why yes certainly she fell upon the neck of her friend embraced her with passion then went away with her treasure the day of the ball arrived madame luzel was a great success she was the prettiest of all elegant gracious smiling and full of joy all the men noticed her asked her name and wanted to be presented she danced with enthusiasm intoxicated with pleasure thinking of nothing but all this admiration this victory so complete and sweet to her heart she went home towards 4 o'clock in the morning her husband had been half asleep in one of the little salons since midnight with three other gentlemen whose wives were enjoying themselves very much he threw around her shoulders the modest wraps they had carried whose poverty clashed with the elegance of the ball costume she wished to hurry away in order not to be noticed by the other women who were wrapping themselves in rich furs lozel detained her wait said he i'm going to call a cab but she would not listen and descended the steps rapidly when they were in the street they found no carriage and they began to seek for one hailing the coachman whom they saw at a distance they walked along towards the river hopeless and shivering finally they found one of those old carriages that one sees in paris after nightfall it took them as far as their door and they went wearily up to their apartment it was all over for her and on his part he remembered that he would have to be at the office by 10 o'clock she removed the wraps from her shoulders before the glass for a final view of herself in her glory suddenly she uttered a cry her necklace was not around her neck read and find out what do miss you and madame lozel do next how do they replace the necklace lozel already half undressed asked what is the matter she turned towards him excitedly i have i have i no longer have madame forestier's necklace he arose in dismay what how is that it is not possible and they looked in the folds of the dress in the folds of the cloak in the pockets everywhere they could not find it he asked you are sure you still had it when we left the minister's house yes i felt it as we came out but if you had lost it in the street we should have heard it fall it must be in the cab yes it is possible did you take the number no and you did you notice what it was 
no. They looked at each other, utterly cast down. Finally, Lozel dressed himself again. I'm going, he said, over the track where we went on foot to see if I can find it. And he went. She remained in her evening gown, not having the force to go to bed. Towards seven o'clock, her husband returned. He had found nothing. He went to the police and to the cab offices and put an advertisement in newspapers offering a reward. She waited all day in a state of bewilderment before this frightful disaster. Lozelle returned in the evening, his face pale. He had discovered nothing. He said, write to your friend that you have broken the clasp of the necklace and that you will have it repaired. That will give us time. She wrote as he dictated. At the end of the week, they had lost all hope and Lozelle, older by five years, declared, we must replace this dwell. In the shop of the Palais Royal, they found the chaplet of diamonds, which seemed to them exactly like the one they had lost. It was valued at 40,000 francs. They could get it for 36,000. Lozelle possessed 18,000 francs, which his father had left him. He borrowed the rest. He made ruinous promises, took money from usurers and the whole race of lenders. Then he went to get the new necklace, depositing on the merchant's counter 36,000 francs. Then Madame Lozelle took back the jewels to Madame Forestier. The latter said to her in a frigid tone, You should have returned them to me sooner, for I might have needed them. Madame Forestier did not open the jewel box as Madame Lozelle feared she would. What would she think if she, if she should perceive the substitution? What should she say? What should she take her for a robber? Madame Lozelle now knew the horrible life of necessity. She did her part, however, completely heroically. It was necessary to pay this frightful debt. She would pay it. They sent away the maid, they changed their lodgings, they rented some rooms in an attic. She learned the odious work of a kitchen. She washed the dishes, she washed the soiled linen, their clothes and dishclothes, which she hung on the line to dry. She took down the refuse to the street each morning and brought up the water, stopping at each landing to catch her breath. And clothed like a woman of the people, she went to the grocers, the butchers and the fruiterers with her basket on her arm, shopping, haggling to the last sow of her miserable money. The husband worked evenings, putting the books of some merchants in order, and nights he often did copying a five sous a page, and this life lasted for ten years. At the end of ten years, they had restored all. Madame Luzelle seemed old now. She had become a strong, hard woman, the crude woman of the poor household. Her hair badly dressed, her skirts awry, her hands red, she spoke in a loud tone and washed the floors with the large pails of water. But sometimes, when her husband was at office, she would seat herself before the window and think of that evening party of former times, of that ball where she was so beautiful and so flattered. How would it have been if she had not lost the necklace? Who knows? How singular is life and how full of changes? How small a thing will ruin or save one? One Sunday, as she was walk- taking a walk in the Champs Elysees to rid herself of the cares of the week, she suddenly perceived a woman walking with the child. It was Madame Forestier, still young, still pretty, still attractive. Madame Luzelle was affected. Should she speak to her? Yes, certainly. And now that she had paid, she would tell her all. Why not? She approached her. Good morning, Jean. Her friend did not recognize her and was astonished to be so familiarly addressed by this common personage. She stammered, But, madam, I don't know. You must be mistaken. No, I'm Matilda Luzelle. Her friend uttered a cry of astonishment. Oh, my poor Matilda, how have you changed? Yes, I have had some hard days since I saw you and some miserable ones and all because of you. Because me? How is that? You recall the diamond necklace that you loaned me to wear to the minister's ball? Yes, very well. Well, I lost it. How was that since you returned it to me? I returned another to you exactly like it. And it has taken us ten years to pay for it. You can understand that it was not easy for us who have nothing. But it is finished and I am decently content. Madame Forestier stopped short, she said. You say that you bought a diamond necklace to replace mine? Yes, you did not perceive it then. They were just alike. 
and she smiled with proud and simple joy madam forestier was touched and took both her hands as she replied oh my poor batilda mine was false they were not worth over 500 francs by guy d mopassent glossary incessantly means continuously to ring means covered dish from which soup is served at the table m is an abbreviation for monsieur mme is abbreviation for madame vexation means a state of being distressed ruinous means disastrous usurers means money lenders especially those who lend money on a high rate of interest sou means a former french coin of low value ori means not in the correct position or shape twisted think about it one the course of the luzel's life changed due to the necklace comment two what was the cause of matilda's ruin how could she have avoided it three what would have happened to matilda if she had confessed to her friend that she had lost her necklace four if you were caught in a situation like this how would you have dealt with it talk about it one the characters in the story speak in english do you think this is their language what clues are there in the story about the language its characters must be speaking in two honesty is the best policy three we should be content with what life gives us suggested reading the dowry by guy de mopassent a cup of tea by katherine mansfield the bet by anton chekhov chapter 8 the hack driver a young lawyer comes to a village to serve summons on oliver lutkins a friendly hack driver takes him around the village in search of lutkins does he find him who is lutkins read and find out why is the lawyer sent to new mullion what does he first think about the place who befriends him where does he take him what does he say about lutkins after graduating with honors i became a junior assistant clerk in a magnificent law firm i was sent not to prepare legal briefs but to serve summons like a cheap private detective I had to go to dirty and shadowy corners of the city to seek out my victims. Some of the larger and more self-confident ones even bet me up. I hated this unpleasant work and the side of city life it revealed to me. I even considered fleeing to my hometown where I could have been a real lawyer right away without going through this unpleasant training period. So I rejoiced one day when they sent me out 40 miles in the country to a town called New Mullion to serve summons on a man called Oliver Lutkins. We needed this man as a witness in a law case and he had ignored all our letters. When I got to New, New Mullion, my eager expectations of a sweet and simple country village were severely disappointed. Its streets were rivers of mud with rows of wooden shops. either painted a sober brown or bare of any paint at all the only agreeable sight about the place was the delivery man at the station he was about 40 red faced cheerful and thick about the middle his working clothes were dirty and well worn and he had a friendly manner you felt at once that he liked people i want i told him to find a man named oliver lutkins lutkins I saw him around here about an hour ago. Hard fellow to catch up though, always up to something or the other. He's probably trying to start up a poker game in the back of Fritz's shop. I will tell you boy, is there any hurry about locating Lutkins? Yes, I want to catch the afternoon train back to the city. I was very important and secret about it. I will tell you what, I have got a hack. I'll get it out and we can drive around together and find Lutkins. I know most of the places he hangs out. He was so open and friendly that I glowed with the warmth of his affection. I knew of course that he wanted the business, but his kindness was real. I was glad the fair money would go to this good fellow. 
I managed to bargain down to two dollars an hour, and then he brought from his house nearby a sort of large black box on wheels. He remarked, "Well, young man, here's the carriage," and his wide smile made me into an old friend. These villagers are so ready to help a stranger. He had already made it his own task to find Oliver Lutkins. For me, he said, I don't want to interfere, young fellow, but my guess is that you want to collect some money from Lutkins. He never pays anybody a cent. He still owes me fifty cents on a poker game. I was a fool enough to play with him. He's not really bad, but it's hard to make him part with his money. If you try to collect from him in those fancy clothes, he will be suspicious and get away from you. If you want, I will go into Fritz and ask for him, and you can keep out of sight behind me. I loved him for this. By myself, I might never have found Lutkins. With the hack driver's knowing help, I was sure of getting my man. I took him into my confidence and told him that I wanted to serve the summons on Lutkins, but the man had refused to be a witness when his information would have quickly settled our case. The driver listened earnestly. At the end, he hit me on the shoulder and laughed. Well, we will give Brother Lutkins a little surprise. Let's start, driver. Most folks around here call me Bill or Magnuson. My business is called William Magnuson Fancy Carting and Hacking. All right, Bill. Shall we proceed to Fritz? Yes, Lutkins is just as likely to be there as anywhere. Plays a lot of poker. He is good at deceiving people. Bill seemed to admire Lutkins' talent for dishonesty. I felt that if he had been a policeman, he would have caught Lutkins respectfully and jailed him with regret. Bill led me into Fritz. Have you seen Oliver Lutkins around today? Friend of his is looking for him. Said Bill cheerily. Fritz looked at me, hiding behind Bill. He hesitated and then admitted, "Yes, he was in here a little while ago. Guess he's gone over to Gustav's to get a shave." Well, if he comes in, tell him I'm looking for him. We drove to Gust- Gustav's barber shop. Again, Bill went in first, and I lingered at the door. He asked not only the Swede but two customers if they had seen Lutkins. The Swede had not. He said angrily, "I haven't seen him and don't care to." But if you find him, you can just collect that dollar thirty-five he owes me. One of the customers thought he had seen Lutkins walking down Main Street, this side of the hotel. As we climbed back into the hack, Bill concluded that since Lutkins had exhausted his credit at Gustav's, he had probably gone to Gray's for a shave. At Gray's barber shop, we missed Lutkins by only five minutes. He had just left, probably for the pool room. At the pool room, it appeared that he had just bought a pack of cigarettes and gone out. So we pursued him, just behind him, but never catching him for an hour till it was past one o'clock. I was hungry, but I had so enjoyed Bill's rough country opinions about his neighbors that I scarcely cared whether I found Lutkins or not. How about eating something? I suggested. Let's go to a restaurant, and I'll buy you lunch. Well, I ought to go home to the wife. I don't care much for these restaurants. Only four of them, and they're all bad. Tell you what, we'll do. We will get the wife to pack up a lunch for us. She won't charge you more than a half a dollar, and it would cost you more for a greasy meal in a restaurant. And we will go up to Wade's Hill and enjoy the view while we eat. Read and find out. What more does Bill say about Lutkins and his family? Does the narrator serve the summons that day? Who is Lutkins? I know that Bill's helpfulness to the young fellow from the city was not entirely a matter of brotherly love. I was paying him for his time. In the end, I paid him for six hours, including the lunch hour, at what was then a very high price. But he was no more dishonest than I. I charged the whole thing to the firm, but it would have been worth paying him myself to have his presence. His cheerful country wisdom was very refreshing to a country boy like myself, who was sick of the city. As we sat on the hill top, looking over the pastures and creek which slipped among the trees, he talked of New Mullion and painted a picture in words of all the people in it. He noticed everything, but no matter how much he might laugh at people, he also understood and forgave their foolishness. He described the minister's wife, who sang the loudest in church when she was most in debt. 
She commented on the boys who came back from college in fancy clothes. He told about the lawyer whose wife could never succeed in getting him to put on both the collar and the tie on the same day. He made them all live. On that day, I came to know New Mullion better than I did the city and to love it better. Bill did know about colleges and cities, but he had travelled around a lot of the country and had had a lot of jobs. From his adventures, he had brought back a philosophy of simplicity and laughter. He strengthened me. We left that peaceful scene of meadows and woods and resumed our search of Oliver Lutkins. We could not find him. At last, Bill cornered a friend of Lutkins and made him admit what he guessed. Oliver's gone out to his mother's farm three miles north. We draw out there laying plants. I know Oliver's mother. She's a terror. Bill sighed. I took a trunk out there for her once and she almost took my skin off because I didn't treat it like a box of eggs. She's about nine feet tall and four feet thick and quick as a cat and she sure can talk. I'll bet Oliver heard that somebody's chasing him and he's gone on there to hide behind his mother's skirts. Well, we will try her. But you would better let me do it, boy. You may be great at literature and law, but you haven't had real training in swearing. We drove into a poor farmyard. We were faced by an enormous and cheerful old woman. My guide bravely went up to her and said, Remember me? I am Bill Magnuson, the carter and hackman. I want to find your son, Oliver. I don't know anything about Oliver and I don't want to, she shouted. Now, look here, we have had just about enough nonsense. This young man represents the court in the city and we have a legal right to search all properties for this Oliver Lutkins. Bill made me sound very important and the woman was impressed. She retired into the kitchen and we followed. She seized an iron from the old-fashioned stove and marched on us shouting, You search all you want to, if you don't mind getting burnt first. She shouted and laughed at our frightened retreat. Let's get out of here. She'll murder us, Bill whispered. Outside, he said, did you see her smile? She was laughing at us. I agreed that it was pretty disrespectful treatment. We did, however, search the house. Since it was only one story high, Bill went around it, peering in at all the windows. We examined the barn and stable. We were reasonably certain that Dutkins was not there. It was nearly time for me to catch the afternoon train and Bill drove me to the station. On the way to the city, I worried very little over my failure to find Lutkins. I was too busy thinking about Bill Magnuson. Really, I considered returning to New Million to practice law. If I had found Bill so deep and richly human, might I not grow to love Fritz and Gustav and a hundred other slow-spoken, simple, wise neighbours? I pictured an honest and happy life beyond the strict limits of universities and law firms. I was excited. I had found a treasure. I had discovered a new way of life. But if I did not think much about Lutkins, the office did. I found them all upset. Next morning, the case was coming up in the court and they have had to have Lutkins. I was shameless, shameful, useless fool. That morning, my promising legal career almost came to an end before it had begun. The chief almost murdered me. He hinted that I might do well at digging ditches. I was ordered back to New Million and with me went a man who had worked with Lutkins. I was rather sorry because it would prevent my loafing all over again with Bill. When the train arrived at New Million, Bill was at the station platform near this cart. Strangely enough that old tigress Lutkin's mother was there and talking and laughing with Bill, not quarrelling at all. From the train steps, I pointed Bill out to my companion and said, There's a fine fellow, a real man. I spent the day with him. He helped you hunt for Oliver Lutkins? Yes, he helped me a lot. He must have. He is Lutkins himself. What really hurt me was that when I served the summons, Lutkins and his mother laughed at me as though I were a bright boy of seven. With loving kindness, they begged me to go with them to a neighbor's house for a cup of coffee. I told them about you and they are anxious to look at you, said Lutkins joyfully. They are about the only folks in the town that missed seeing you yesterday. By Sinclair Lewis Glossary Hack means a horse-drawn vehicle. 
agreeable sight means pleasant sight poker means a card game in which bluff is used as players bet on the value of their cards earnestly means very seriously creek means short arm of river inlet on sea coast think about it one when the lawyer reached new bullion did bill know that he was looking for lutkins when do you think bill came up with his plan for fooling the lawyer two lutkins openly takes the lawyer all over the village how is it that no one lets out the secret hint notice that the hat driver asks the lawyer to keep out of sight behind them when they go into fritz can you find other such subtle ways in which lutkins manipulates the tour 3 why do you think lutkins neighbors were anxious to meet the lawyer 4 after his first day's experience with the hack driver the lawyer thinks of returning to new bullion to practice law do you think he would have considered this idea after his second visit 5 do you think the lawyer was gullible how could he have avoided being taken for a ride talk about it 1 Do we come across persons like Lutkins only in fiction or do we encounter them in real life as well? You can give examples from fiction or narrate an incident that you have read in the newspaper or an incident from real life. 2. Who is a con man or a confidence trickster? Suggested reading: The Questionable Cargo by Captain W. E. Johns, My Last Dollar by Stephen Leacock. Baron Bowmilk's ailment by Satyajit Ray Chapter 9 Boli From her very childhood Boli was neglected at home Why did her teacher take special interest in her Did Boli measure up to her teacher's expectations Read and find out why is Boli's father worried about her For what unusual reasons is Boli sent to school Her name was Suleika but since her childhood everyone has been calling her Boli the simple term she was the fourth daughter of Nambedar Ramlal when she was 10 months old she had fallen off the cot on her head and perhaps it had damaged some part of her brain that was why she remained a backward child and came to be known as Boli the simple term at birth the child was very fair and pretty but when she was 2 years old she had an attack of smallpox only the eyes were saved but the entire body was permanently disfigured by deep black pock marks little suleika could not speak till she was 5 and when at last she learned to speak she stammered the other children often made fun of her and mimicked her as a result she talked very little ramlal had seven children three sons and four daughters and the youngest of them was boli it was a prosperous farmer's household and there was plenty to eat and drink all the children except boli were healthy and strong the sons had been sent to the city to study in schools and later in colleges of the daughters radha the eldest had already been married the second daughter mangla's marriage had also been settled and when that was done ramlal would think of the third champa they were good looking healthy girls and it was not difficult to find bridegrooms for them but ramlal was worried about boli she had neither good looks nor intelligence boli was 7 years old when mangla was married the same year a primary school for girls was opened in their village the tehsildar sahib came to perform its opening ceremony he said to ramlal as a revenue official you are the representative of the government in the village and so you must set an example to the villagers you must send your daughters to school that night when ramlal consulted his wife she cried are you crazy if girls go to school who will marry them but ramlal had not the courage to disobey the tehsildar at last his wife said I will tell you what to do send boli to school as it is there is a little chance of her getting married with her ugly face and lack of sense let the teachers at school worry about her read and find out does boli enjoy her first day at school does she find her teacher different from the people at home 
The next day Ramlal caught Boli by the hand and said Come with me I will take you to school Boli was frightened she did not know what a school was like she remembered how a few days ago their old cow lakshmi had been turned out of the house and sold no 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 she shouted in terror and pulled her hand away from her father's grip what's the matter with you you fool shouted ramlal i am only taking you to school then he told his wife let her wear some decent clothes today or else what else will the teachers and other school girls think of us when they see her new clothes had never been made for boli the old dresses of her sisters were passed on to her no one cared to mend or wash her clothes but today she was lucky to receive a clean dress which had shrunk after many washings and no longer fitted champa she was even bathed and oil was rubbed into her dry and matted hair only then did she begin to believe that she was being taken to a place better than her home When they reached the school the children was already in their classrooms Ramlal handed over his daughter to the headmistress left alone the poor girl looked about her with fear laden eyes there were several rooms and in each room girls like her squatted on mats reading from books or writing on slates the headmistress asked Boli to sit down in a corner in one of the classrooms Boli did not know what exactly a school was like and what happened there but she was glad to find so many girls almost of her own age present there she hoped that one of these girls might become her friend the lady teacher who was in the class was saying something to the girls but boli could understand nothing she looked at the pictures on the wall the colors fascinated her the horse was brown just like the horse on which the tehsildar had come to visit her village The goat was black like the goat of their neighbor the parrot was green like the parrots she had seen in the mango orchard and the cow was just like that lakshmi and suddenly boli noticed that the teacher was standing by her side smiling at her what's your name little one bho 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 she could stammer no further than that then she began to cry and tears flowed from her eyes in a helpless flood She kept her head down as she sat in her corner not daring to look up at the girls who she knew were still laughing at her when the school bell rang all the girls scurried out of the classroom but boli dared not leave her corner her head still lowered she kept on sobbing boli the teacher's voice was so soft and soothing in all her life she had never been called like that it touched her heart get up said the, said the teacher It was not a command but just a friendly suggestion. Boli got up. Now tell me your name. Sweat broke out over her whole body. Would her stammering tongue again disgrace her? For the sake of this kind woman, however, she decided to make an effort. She had such a soothing voice, she would not laugh at her. Bho, 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 bho. She began to stammer. Well done, well done. The teacher encouraged her. Come on now the full name bo 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 boli at last she was able to say it and felt relieved as if it was a great achievement well done the teacher patted her affectionately and said put the fear out of your heart and you will be able to speak like everyone else boli looked up as if to ask really yes yes it will be very easy you just come to school every day will you come Boli nodded. No, say it aloud. Yes. And Boli herself was astonished that she had been able to say it. Didn't I tell you? Now take this book. The book was full of nice pictures and the pictures were in color. Dog, cat, goat, horse, parrot, tiger and a cow just like Lakshmi. And with every picture was a word in big black letters. in one month you will be able to read this book then i will give you a bigger book then a still bigger one in time you will be more learned than anyone else in the village then no one will ever be able to laugh at you people will listen to you with respect and you will be able to speak without the slightest stammer understand now go home and come back early tomorrow morning 
Boli felt as if suddenly all the bells in the village temple were ringing and the trees in front of the school house had blossomed into big red flowers. Her heart was throbbing with a new hope and a new life. Read and find out why do Boli's parents accept Bishambar's marriage proposal? Why does the marriage not take place? Thus, the years passed. The village became a small town. The little primary school became a high school. There were now a cinema under a tin shed and a cotton grinding mill. The mail train began to stop at the railway station. One night after dinner, Ramlal said to his wife, Then, shall I accept Bishambar's proposal? Yes, certainly, his wife said. The Boli will be lucky to get such a well-to-do bridegroom. A big shop, a house of her own, and I hear several thousand in the bank. Moreover, he is not asking for any dowry. That's right, but he is not so young, you know, almost the same age as I am. And he also limps. Moreover, the children from his first wife are quite grown up. So, what does it matter, his wife replied. Forty-five or fifty, it is no great age for a man. We are lucky that he is from another village and does not know about her pockmarks and her lack of sense. If we don't accept this proposal, she may remain unmarried all her life. Yes, but I wonder what Boli will say. What will that witless one say? She is like a dumb cow. Maybe you are right, muttered Ramlal. In the other corner of the courtyard, Boli lay awake on her cot listening to her parents' whispered conversation. Bishambar Nath was a well-to-do grocer. He came with a big party of friends and relations with him for the wedding. A brass band playing a popular tune from an Indian film headed the procession, with the bridegroom riding a decorated horse. Ramlal was overjoyed to see such pomp and splendor. He had never dreamt that his fourth daughter would have such a grand wedding. Boli's elder sisters, who had come for the occasion, were envious of her luck. When the auspicious moment came, the priest said, Bring the bride. Boli, clad in a red silken bridal dress, was led to the bride's place near the sacred fire. Garland the bride, one of his friends, prompted Bishambar Nath. The bridegroom lifted the garland of yellow marigolds. A woman slipped back the silken veil from the bride's face. Bishambar took a quick glance. The garland remained poised in his hands. The bride slowly pulled down the veil over his face. Have you seen her? said Bishambar to the friend next to him. She has pockmarks on her face. So what? You are not young either. Maybe, but if I am to marry her, her father must give me 5,000 rupees. Ramlal went and placed his turban, his honour, at Bishambar's feet. Do not humiliate me so. Take 2,000 rupees. No. 5,000 or we go back. Keep your daughter. Be a little considerate, please. If you go back, I can never show my face in the village. Then out with 5,000. Tears streaming down his face, Ramlal went in, opened the safe and counted out the notes. He placed the bundle at the bridegroom's feet. On Bishambar's greedy face appeared a triumphant smile. He had gambled and won. Give me the garland, he announced. Once again, the veil was slipped back from the bride's face, but this time, her eyes were not downcast. She was looking up, looking straight at her prospective husband, and in her eyes there was neither anger nor hate, only cold contempt. Bishambar raised the garland to place it around the bride's neck, but before he could do so, Boli's hand struck out like a streak of lightning and the garland was flung into the air. She got up and threw away the veil. Pitaji, said Boli in a clear loud voice, and her father, mother, sisters, brothers, relations and neighbours were startled to hear her speak without even the slightest stammer. Pitaji, take back your money. I am not going to marry this man. Ramlal was thunderstruck. The guests began to whisper, so shameless, so ugly and so shameless. Boli, are you crazy? shouted Ramlal. You want to disgrace your family? Have some regard for our Izzat. For the sake of your Izzat, said Boli, I was willing to marry this lame old man, but I will not have such a mean, greedy and contemptible coward as my husband. I won't, I won't, I won't. 
What a shameless girl. We all thought she was a harmless dumb cow. Polly turned violently on the old woman. Yes, auntie, you are right. You all thought I was a dumb driven cow. That's why you wanted me wanted to hand me over to this heartless creature. But now the dumb cow, the stammering fool is speaking. Do you want to hear more? Bishambarnath the grocer started to go back with his party. The confused bandsmen thought this was the end of the ceremony and struck up a closing song. Ramlal stood rooted to the ground. His head bowed low with the weight of grief and shame. The flames of the sacred fire slowly died down. Everyone was gone. Ramlal turned to Boli and said, "But what about you? No one will ever marry you now. What shall we do with you?" And Suleika said in a voice that was calm and steady, "Don't you worry, Pitaji. In your old age, I will serve you and mother, and I will teach the same school where I learned so much." Isn't that right, madam? The teacher had all along stood in a corner watching the drama. Yes, Bolly, of course, she replied, and in her smiling eyes was the light of a deep satisfaction that an artist feels when contemplating the completion of her masterpiece. By K. A. Abbas. Glossary. Simpleton means a foolish person, easily tricked by others. Number dar. means an official who collects revenue matted means entangled squatted means sat on their heels scurried means ran or moved hurriedly ginning means separating raw cotton from its seeds downcast means looking downwards think about it one boli had many apprehensions about going to school What made her feel that she was going to a better place than her home? Two. How did Bolly's teacher play an important role in changing the course of her life? Three. Why did Bolly at first agree to an unequal match? Why did she later reject the marriage? What does this tell us about her? Four. Bolly's real name is Suleika. We are told this right at the beginning. but only in the last but one paragraph of the story is bodhi called suleka again why do you think she is called suleka at that point in the story five bodhi story must have moved you do you think girl children are not treated at par with boys you are aware that the government has introduced a scheme to save the girl child as the sex ratio is declining the scheme is called beti bachao beti padhao save the girl child read about the scheme and design a poster in groups of 4 and display on the school notice board talk about it one bolly's teacher helped her overcome social barriers by encouraging and motivating her how do you think you can contribute towards changing the social attitudes illustrated in the story two should girls be aware of their rights and assert them should girls and boys have the same rights duties and privileges what are some of the ways in which society treats them differently when we speak of human rights to be differentiate between girls rights and boys rights 3 do you think the characters in the story were speaking to each other in english if not in which language were they speaking you can get clues from the names of the persons and the non english words used in the story suggested reading the brass gong by kazi abdul satar old man at the bridge by ernest hemingway gandhi ji the teacher by rajkumari amrit kaur chapter 10 the book that saved the earth mother goose is a well known book of nursery rhymes in english do you think such a book can save planet earth from a martian invasion Read this play set four centuries in the future and find out. Characters: Historian, Great and Mighty Think Tank, Apprentice Noodle, Captain Omega, Lieutenant Iota, Sergeant Oop, Offstage Voice. Scene one. Read and find out why was the twentieth century called the era of the book? who tried to invade the earth in the 21st century time the 25th century place the museum of ancient history department of the 20th century on the planet earth 
before rice spotlight shines on historian who is sitting at a table down right on which is a movie projector a sign on an easel beside her reads museum of ancient history department of the 20th century she stands and bows to the audience historian good afternoon welcome to our museum of ancient history and to my department curiosities of the good old far off 20th century the 20th century was often called the era of the book in those days there were books about everything from ant eaters to zoolists books taught people how to and when to and where to and why to they illustrated educated punctuated and even decorated but the strangest thing a book ever did was to save the earth you haven't heard about the martian invasion of 2040 this this what do they teach children nowadays well you know the invasion never really happened because a single book stopped it what was the book you ask a noble encyclopedia a tome about rockets and missiles a secret file from outer space no it was none of those it was but here let me turn on the historiscope and show you what happened many centuries ago in 2040 she turns on projector and points it to left spotlight on historian goes out and comes up down left on think tank who is seated on a raised box arms folded he has a huge egg shaped beard and he wears a long robe decorated with stars and circles apprentice noodle stands beside him at an elaborate switchboard a sign on an easel reads mars space control great and mighty think tank commander in chief bow low before entering noodle bowing oh great and mighty think tank most powerful and intelligent creature in the whole universe what are your orders think tank peevishly you left out part of my salutation apprentice noodle go over the whole thing again noodle it shall be done sir oh great and mighty think tank ruler of mars and her two moons most powerful and intelligent creature in the whole universe what are your orders think tank that's better noodle i wish to be placed in communication with our manned space probe to that ridiculous little planet we are going to put under our generous rulership what do, what do they call it again noodle earth your intelligence think tank earth of course you see how insignificant the place is but first something important my mirror i wish to consult my mirror noodle it shall be done sir he hands think tank a mirror think tank mirror mirror in my hand who is the most fantastically intellectually gifted being in the land off stage voice you sir think tank quicker answer quicker next time i hate to slow mirror he admires himself in the mirror ah there i am are we martians not a handsome race so much more attractive than those ugly earthlings with their tiny heads noodle you keep on exercising your mind and some day you will have a balloon brain just like mine noodle oh i hope so mighty think tank i hope so think tank now contact the space probe i want to invade that primitive ball of mud called earth before lunch noodle it shall be done sir he adjusts levers on switchboard electronic buzzes and beeps are heard as the curtains open scene 2 read and find out what guesses are made by think tank about the books found on earth time a few seconds later place mars space control and the centerville public library at rice captain omega stands at center opening and closing card catalog drawers in a confused fashion lieutenant iota is up left counting books in a bookcase sergeant oop is at right operating and closing a book turning it upside down shaking it and then rifling the pages and shaking his head noodle i have close sighting of the space cruiser think tank puts on a pair of enormous goggles and turns towards the stage to watch 
they seem to have entered some sort of a earth structure think tank excellent make voice contact noodle mars space control calling the crew of probe 1 mars space control calling the crew of probe 1 come in captain omega and give us your location omega speaking into a disc which is on a chin around her neck captain omega to mars space control lieutenant iota sergeant ope and i have arrived on earth without incident we have taken shelter in this square place have you any idea where we are lieutenant iota iota i can't figure it out captain holding up a book i have counted 2000 of these peculiar items this place must be some sort of a storage barn what do you think sergeant oop oop i have the clue i have been to seven galaxies but i have never seen anything like this maybe they are hats say maybe this is a harbed ashri omega perhaps the great and mighty think tank will give us the benefit of his thought on this matter think tank elementary my dear omega hold one of the items up so that i may view it closely yes yes i understand now since earth creatures are always eating the place in which you find yourselves is undoubtedly a crude refreshment stand omega he says we are in a refreshment stand oop well the earthlings certainly have a strange diet think tank that item in your hand is called a sandwich omega a sandwich iota a sandwich oop a sandwich think tank sandwiches are the main staple of earth diet look at it closely there are two slices of what is called bread and between them is some sort of a filling omega that is correct sir think tank to confirm my opinion i order you to eat it omega eat it think tank do you doubt the mighty think tank omega oh no no but poor lieutenant iota has not had her breakfast lieutenant lieutenant iota i order you to eat this this sandwich iota eat it oh captain it's it's a very great honor to be the first martian to eat a sandwich i am sure but but how can i be so impolite as to eat before my sergeant handing oop the book and saying brightly sergeant oop i order you to eat the sandwich immediately oop who lieutenant me lieutenant iota and omega for the glory of mars oop oop yes of course immediately he opens his mouth wide omega and iota watch him breathlessly he bites down a corner of the book and pantomimes chewing and swallowing while making terrible faces omega well oop iota well oop think tank was it not delicious sergeant oop oop that is correct sir it was not delicious i don't know how the earthlings can get those sandwiches down without water they are dry as marshy and dust noodle sir sir great and mighty think tank i beg your pardon but an insig- insignificant bit of data floated into my mind about these sandwiches think tank it can't be worth much but go ahead give us your trifling bit of data noodle well sir i have seen surveyor films of those sandwiches i noticed that the earthlings did not eat them they used them as some sort of communication device think tank hotly naturally that was my next point these are actually communication sandwiches think tank is never wrong who is never wrong all great and mighty think tank is never wrong think tank therefore i order you to listen to them omega listen to them iota and oop listen to them think tank do you have marbles in your ears i said listen to them omega it shall be done sir they each take two books from the case and hold them to their ears listening intently iota do you hear anything omega nothing do you hear anything oop oop not a thing omega and iota shh they listen intently again think tank well well report to me what do you hear omega nothing sir perhaps we are not on the correct frequency iota nothing sir perhaps the earthlings have sharper ears than we do oop i don't hear a thing maybe the sandwiches don't make sounds think tank what the somebody suggest the mighty think tank has made a mistake 
omega oh no sir no sir we will keep listening noodle please excuse me your brilliance but a cloudy piece of information is twirling around in my head think tank well twirl it out noodle and i will clear it for you noodle i seem to recall that the earthlings did not listen to the sandwiches they opened them and watched them think tank yes that is quite correct i will clarify that for you captain omega those sandwiches are not for your communication they are for eye communication now captain omega take that large colorful sandwich over there it appears to be important tell me what you observe omega picks up a very large volume of mother goose holding it so that the audience can see the title iota looks over her left shoulder and oop peers over her right shoulder omega it appears to contain pictures of earthlings iota there seems to be some sort of a code think tank code i told you this was important describe the code oop it's little lines and squiggles and dots thousands of them alongside the pictures think tank perhaps the earthlings are not as primitive as we have thought we must break the code noodle forgive me your cleverness but did not the chemical department give our space people vitamins to increase their intelligence think tank stop a thought of magnificent brilliance has come to me space people our chemical department has given you vitamins to increase your intelligence take them immediately and then watch the sandwich the meaning of the code will slowly unfold before you omega it shall be done sir remove vitamins present vitamins swallow vitamins think tank excellent now decipher that code all it shall be done sir they frown over the book turning pages omega aha iota oh ho oop ha 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 think tank what does it say tell me this instant transcribe omega omega yes sir she reads with great seriousness mistress mary quite contrary how does your garden grow with cockle shells and silver bells and pretty maids all them in a row oop ha 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 imagine that pretty maids growing in a garden think tank stop this is no time for levity don't you realize the seriousness of this discovery the earthlings have discovered how to combine agriculture and mining they can actually grow crops of rare metals such as silver and cockle shells they can grow high explosive too noodle contact our invasion fleet noodle they are ready to go down and take over earth sir think tank tell them to hold tell them new information has come to us about earth iota transcribe iota yes sir she see, she reads very gravely hey diddle diddle the cat and the fiddle the cow jumped over the moon the little dog laughed to see such sport and the dish ran away with the spoon oop oh the dish ran away with the spoon laughing think tank sees laughter desist this is more and more alarming the earthlings have reached a high level of civilization didn't you hear they have taught their domesticated animals musical culture and space techniques even their dogs have a sense of humor why at this very moment they may be launching an interplanetary attack of millions of cows notify the inflation feed no inflation today oop transcribe the next code oop yes sir humpty dumpty sat on the wall humpty dumpty had a great fall all the king's horses and all the king's men cannot put humpty dumpty together again oh look sir here is a picture of humpty dumpty why sir he looks like uh, he looks like turns picture of humpty dumpty towards think tank and the audience think tank screaming and holding his head it's me it's my great and mighty balloon brain the earthlings have seen me and they are after me had a great fall that means they plan to capture mars central control and me it's an invasion of mars noodle prepare a space capsule for me i must escape without delay space people you must leave earth at once but be sure to remove all traces of your visit the earthlings must not know that i know omega iota and oop rush about putting books back on shelves noodle where shall we go sir think tank 100 million miles away from mars order the invasion fleet 
to evacuate the entire planet of Mars. We are heading for Alpha Centauri, 100 million miles away. Omega, Iota and Oop run off right as noodle helps. Think tank off left and the curtain closes. Spotlight shines on historian down right. Historian, chuckling. And that's how one dusty old book of nursery rhymes saved the world from a Martian invasion. As you all know, in the 25th century, 500 years after all this happened, we Earthlings resumed contact with Mars and we even became very friendly with the Martians. By that time, great and mighty think tank had been replaced by a very clever Martian, the wise and wonderful Noodle. Oh yes, we taught the Martians the difference between sandwiches and books. We taught them how to read too and we established a model library in their capital city of Marsopolis. But as you might expect, there is still one book that the Martians can never bring themselves to read. You have guessed it, Mother Goose by Claire Boyko. Glossary Easel means wooden frame to support a blackboard or a picture. Zulus means an African ethnic group belonging to South Africa. Apprentice means learner of a trade who has agreed to work for a certain period of time in return for being taught. Peevishly means irritably. Riffling means quickly turning over the pages of a book. Barn means covered building for storing hay. Haberdashery shop means a shop which sells clothing, small articles of dress, pins, cotton, etc. Squiggles means scrawls, illegible writing or markings. Decipher means find the meaning of something which is puzzling or difficult to understand. Transcribe means write in full form from shorthand. Levity means tendency to treat serious matters without respect, lack of seriousness. Think about it. 1. Noodle avoids offending think tank. But at the same time, he corrects his mistakes. How does he manage to do that? 2. If you were in Noodle's place, how would you handle Think Tank's mistakes? 3. Do you think books are being replaced by the electronic media? Can we do away with books altogether? 4. Why are books referred to as a man's best companion? Which is your favorite book and why? Write a paragraph about that book talk about it. 1. In what ways does Think Tank misinterpret innocent nursery rhymes as threats to the Martians? Can you think of any incidents where you misinterpreted a word or an action? How did you resolve the misunderstanding? 2. The aliens in this play speak English. Do you think this is their language? What could be the language of the aliens? Suggested reading. Diamond cuts diamond. By J. H. Parker, The Cinderella Story by Kenneth Lillington, The Fun They Had by Isaac Asimov. Answers given by Professor Yashpal and Dr. Rahul Pal. 1. DNA exists as strands of bases that carry genetic information specific to each living thing. The sequence of bases of DNA in each of our cells is the same but differs from that of any other living thing except possibly an identical twin. This difference makes the DNA break at different places when certain proteins called enzymes are added to it, resulting in smaller DNA fragments of different sizes. These fragments migrate at different rates in an electric field resulting in a unique pattern. This pattern is referred to as a DNA fingerprint. Our DNA is inherited from our parents. Some parts come from the father and some from the mother. DNA fingerprinting can help identify parent age since a son or a daughter would always inhibit, exhibit a pattern identifiable as coming from both parents. DNA fingerprinting analysis is very useful in forensic science from a single hair or a tiny spot of blood, it is possible to prove the innocence or guilt of a murder suspect. Similarly, it is also possible to identify human remains after violent accidents have caused disfigurement. It has been suggested 
that in the not so distant future a dna fingerprinting profile of the individual will have to accompany applications for an id card a bank account and a driving license human right groups say this type of genetic profiling constitutes an invasion of privacy as with a lot of new technology dna fingerprinting has a potential for abuse 2 honey bees are very sophisticated at position location and navigation it is known that they use the sun as a guide they also appear to have a good memory they convey the information of a new find of food to the hive through an amazingly clever dance language the dance indicates the direction and distance of the food source with respect to the direction of the sun in the sky if it is dark inside the hive and a light bulb is switched on the dance is modified to include the light bulb as a new reference direction since bees have a pictorial memory of some sort a direction finding mechanism and a way of reckoning distance they are probably better equipped for getting back home than any of us 3 rain is the result of condensation of vapor when the air is cooled below the dew point all the vapor in a cloud cannot condense at the same time and turn into a large pool of water pockets of air move up independently and slowly cool till condensation begins and water droplets form it is believed that most rain drops start out as tiny ice crystals so tiny that they float down slowly accreting more moisture on the way at lower altitudes the crystals melt into water droplets in colder climates the crystal reaches the ground as snowflakes